We're at Monroe & Associates in Auburn Hills, Michigan. It's a company that dismantles cars into their thousands of pieces to figure out how they're made and how they work. We've got a rare opportunity here and we intend to take full advantage of it. We're surrounded by parts. Parts of three of the most popular electric cars in the market today, each representing a very, very different approach to designing and building EVs. The Chevy Bolt, the BMW i3, and of course, the Tesla Model 3. Since we have them all in pieces, we can dig really, really deep and see exactly how they work. This is gonna be really, really geeky, but really interesting and fun. We're excited. So the three cars that we're gonna look at today all do things very differently. Jason, how different are they? If we look at Chevy, you know, GM's version of an electric car is clearly evolved and derived from what they know best, which is building gasoline cars by the million. So what we've got here is essentially an adaptation of a front wheel drive, transverse engine, like economy car, like a Spark or a Cruise or something like that. So you've got your motors up front driving the front wheels, all the other related hardware and voltage management and all the other crap is up front. They packed everything up front where they're used to packaging an engine. The floor has been replaced with a battery pack that kicks up at the back. So in the end, what you've got packaging wise and space wise is about the same as what you're used to with a normal little hatchback. Trunk area in the back, seats up front, unusable area in the very front. So we'll call this the, uh, the conventional approach. I3 is the weirdo approach. BMW took some really big, strange risks when they made this guy. The fundamental layout is different. It's rear motor, rear I guess motor instead of an engine because it's electric. Which is something you wouldn't see in an economy car or a hatchback. It's not something well, you'd not see Not for today. years, not since Beatles, you know, were driving all over the road. So this is unusual. But it makes sense here. Like why cram everything up front? So they put the motor in the back kind of low. There's a cargo area above it. The batteries are in the floor and there's enough room for a little, it's not a big front trunk, but it's a little front trunk and then they have some HVAC equipment under here. But the way the space is utilized is actually kind of better because the entire length of the car, on some level, you can use for either you or your stuff to some degree. It's still pretty cramped up there. Now, Tesla's using kind of a clean sheet approach, but something that looks like it'll be much more conducive to be mass produced. It's also rear motor, rear drive, all the electronics that handle, you know, for managing voltages and all the other stuff is in a box right in front of the rear motor. So all your weight and everything is kind of low and down at the rear. And then the entire floor is battery pack. And they actually end up with a lot of room up front. They've done a lot of really tight integration of everything. So the packaging and space utilization of this is pretty fantastic. Yeah, it is. A good size trunk up front, all of the area in the middle for people and cargo, and then a good size trunk in the back. It's a very efficient packaging solution. And there's a lot of complicated reasons why this is all the case and why GM's doing it this way. And I guess that's what uh, we're we'll gonna, gonna look into now. Talk to some experts about. David, there's so much stuff around here. There's so many parts and everything looks so complicated. How, how, what's the best way to do this? Um, if we wanna understand different ways to developing an EV, let's go from system to system. So like motor, body, electronics, batteries. Let's start mm -hmm. with batteries. Batteries are a big deal. Okay. Okay, so keeping with the theme of different ways to design an electric vehicle, we've got three different battery setups. Here on my left, this is a Tesla Model 3 battery module. Here, BMW i3 modules, and then we've got the Bolt module. Now we should mention, even though each of these modules looks extremely different, they're actually even more different on the inside. So for example, even though you'll never normally get to see this, the Tesla battery packs are made up of I don't know how many. How many are in there? 4,416. This is Mark Ellis, by the way. Yes. So Tesla uses little cylindrical batteries. The Bolt is using batteries that look kind of like a giant Pop-Tart in a wrapper. They're not these exact ones, but it's this general kind of pouch style battery. And the i3 is using what they call prismatic batteries, which are uh, inside a little boxy volume of about this size. Which has three individual cells that are wrapped together inside of this and connected so they act as one battery. Tesla, when they first came out with this cylindrical cell battery pack idea, everybody in the industry thought they were crazy because it is so difficult to control charge rates, discharge rates, balancing of all of the batteries, but they proved everybody who thought they were experts wrong, and they can control the voltages. This type of cell, this is the oldest of the three battery packs. This type of cell was preferred because with a prismatic can, 
you can pack more energy into a small space. So that's why I think BMW picked Prismatic. Pouch cells are very expensive to make and they're very difficult to make. What's the, what's the takeaway then? Why is the Tesla solution, why did they pick it? What makes it better? I can have a much lower profile using the cylindrical batteries than I can the prismatic stuff. So you don't have to jack up your ground clearance to fit your batteries in. Right, so it takes up less space. So now another big issue with batteries I know is they, they're very temperature sensitive. I'm told they like to be the same temperature as people, so we have to heat them and cool them. Yeah. Can you maybe explain the different approaches each company is taking to that problem? This is the oldest one, BMW. BMW made an aluminum extruded structure that these sat on like a big tray. That was their cooling tray. Okay. And they ran coolant through the first versions of the, like air conditioning mm -hmm. coolant, through the first versions of their battery pack. These are refrigerant cools. These were refrigerant, yeah. They also had a resistance heater so that when it was plugged in, instead of cooling the battery, if it needed to be heated, there was resistant heaters underneath all of these battery packs. How does the Bolt handle the same problem? The Bolt has a big cooling tray that these batteries sit on, and basically it's just cooled through the bottom, and they use the same kind of coolant you use in the radiator. How is the Tesla doing things different? Well, with the Tesla battery pack, they have aluminum extruded channels that run the length of the battery pack. And each one of these cells is positioned so that it comes into contact with one of the cooling channels. Just to make okay. it clear, it's sort of like a lasagna. It like is. There's like a row of little cells, and then there's a wavy thing like a lasagna noodle that's actually got tiny little channels in it. Little square channels, through. yeah. That the coolant goes yeah. through. Instead of these, where you have something to keep it cool on the outside, inside the battery pack itself, they're flowing coolant in through those lasagna noodles. Is there an advantage to the internal thermal management and cooling to these guys as opposed to the external to these? Like, what's the benefit for all that work? With the fast charging, yeah. they are able to remove heat from the cells as they are being fast charged much easier than you can with these two types of configuration. This is kind of uh, the fun part here because we're going to be talking about drivetrains. Mm. We're talking about the actual motors, the things that make the car go, that spin the wheels. They are analogous to an engine in your normal car, which is gigantic. And yeah. if you look at these, they're tiny. A big V6, yeah. you know, makes 300 horsepower, and, and this is significantly smaller. Significantly. Like a V6 would take up like this area way a ton more. That's part of why there's so many fewer moving parts in an EV and why on some level they might be easier to build. There's actually a lot of different ways to do this and luckily we have someone here who knows all about that kind of thing. Talk, talk to us about these motors. This Tesla motor is the smallest and the lightest and it makes 300 horsepower. The BMW motor appears to be the biggest and maybe the heaviest, and it's making 170. And then kind of in the middle is the Bolt, still bigger than the Tesla, and it's making 200. Why the difference in like size, for example? Why is the Tesla one so much smaller and this BMW one so much bigger with all these extra parts? You know, you got the motor packaging itself, and then you're also looking at the housing, which is directly correlated to the cooling and the way they cooled the motors. So the motors, you know, the package size there, they start there, and then you have to package everything else around it to fit it underneath, you know, in the vehicle itself. So you also have a couple other factors that are in here. When you look at the motor designs, you know, you have a hairpin design where they just take rods and stick them in and crimp them over and spot weld them. Then you have the wire wound, which is what All these the different I3, little wires. Yeah, the yeah. individual wires, and then the Tesla is using the same thing. And then thing. they're kind of strung up like a, yeah. like a roast. Just basically you have to wind them, and then they press them into the slots, and then they have to be tied where they're just pressing these in and bending them over and welding them. And then and that's creating your different poles in here when you're three-phase. So as you're alternating it around, you're creating north-south and you're just rotating it around to make the motor move. Right, because so, you're basically, all of these work, you're spinning a one magnetic field inside of another stationary magnetic correct. field. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so these are going to be stationary, your stators, and then your rotors have the permanent magnets in it. Okay. It could be a combination of the material in the magnets. Uh, it could be the poles. 
it could be a whole systems approach when you look at the total current availability, when you look at the battery pack sizes. So you that's know, why we're getting the difference in power. It's not yeah. just the motor, it's the it's whole. A, it's a whole system. So yeah, what you the would battery have to look can at the whole put system. out and everything. Yeah. So yeah. you put maybe this motor in a Tesla system and the output could change dramatically, right? Potentially, yes. Hmm. Now, so why, why is this in two huge pieces like this? Well, this is part of their cooling system. So these are actually cooling channels. Yeah. There's actually ports on the outside of the housing here and they run coolant around the inside of the housing which is going to be routed in here. Yeah. And this stator is actually pressed into here. If you look, you can see this where we had to cut it. Yeah. So this is actually heated up and once cooled, then they actually shrink fit it together and press it oh, together. Wow. So you have a constant surface contact in mm -hmm. here and your heat transitions from the stator to here, which goes to the coolant, which is then pulled out of the motor itself. This is so big because it's basically a tub full of coolant coiled around here. And these guys do it differently. They don't right. need this big tub inside of it. Right, and they thing. don't have the cooling channels around the outside. Right. So if you look at what we have over here on the bolt, they do have a, a cooling module right here, a heat exchanger right here in the end. You see this plate, you got the two tubes coming in here. Right. So they have this is it immersed in oil. So the oil is flowing around it and the oil is sitting down here and the heat from the oil is transferring to the coolant and they're pulling the heat out that way. And the Tesla is similar? And the Tesla is similar, yeah, it's oil cooled. Um, they take it a little a step further where you don't see the channels in here. Yeah. Uh, this is just kind of setting in here and you'll have a system, you know, the oil will be flowing over it. What these guys are doing is you can see a channel coming around the outside of the stator. And if you look right here, you got a couple of passageways here. So they're actually sending the oil into the center of the stator and then it flows out through the laminates. You can see the slots in the laminates. So they're actually pulling the oil through the laminates. Okay, all the motors are fundamentally the same in principle. They're cooled wildly different and that's accounting for why they're so different in size. And, and packaging, and yeah, packaging. And overall packaging. Yeah. And the power is a result of not just the motor, but the entire setup of the car. Correct. Okay. Yeah, hmm. That'd be a good way of looking at it. So now we're going to look at some different approaches to electronics. We're here with Dave Warner, Monroe's electronics guru. We're looking at power inverter modules. And what do uh, they do? Yeah. Well, this takes power from the battery uh, and it converts it into a form usable for the electric motor. Yeah. And also on engine brake, well, breakdown, coast down, it converts energy from the motor like a generator and puts this back into the battery. So when you hit the throttle, hit the gas pedal or the electrons pedal, mm -hmm. then this thing is what gets the power from the battery into the motor, you go faster. The go, this makes it go. That is correct. Okay, all right, that's simple. So this is the one that the Tesla's using. That's correct. And then this is the one the Bolt's using. That is They're doing the same basic job. Yes. Why do they look so different? The way they've integrated it into the vehicle. This one, it, it is mounted directly. It's an integral part of your powertrain motor gearbox module. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Chevy Bolt, this sits on top of the motor as a separate entity with separate cabling between the motor and it, separate cooling lines. This one shares all of that internally so the package is smaller and as you can see uh, all of the, the, the pertinent parts are there. We've got our our main switching device, we've got our uh, DC link capacitor, we've got major bus bars, yeah. and we've got your controls. Everything's shaped and packed in really tight. Yes. It just fits in. It's, like a, it's really organic looking, yeah, actually. Yeah, it is. It looks like an organ. When we come to the, the bolt, we have two control boards, not one. Yeah. We have an IGBT or switching package. We have your DC link with bus bars. We have a cover. And a lot of a lot of open space, I guess, for cabling and all the cooling or whatever. You're absolutely correct. And that You're takes up a lot correct. of room. It, it does. So this one fits right there in the motor package, way down below. This mm -hmm. one's above the motor, taking up more room in that front compartment. And this kind of integration you're seeing throughout the Model 3? One would get the impression that the vehicle was designed from the ground up as an electric vehicle, where the other one maybe was an adaption from a, uh, a more traditional vehicle yeah. to the electric market. So. All right, so we just saw two different designs. What do you see as uh, the future of electrification? This sort of integrated setup or kind of these individual Mod modules? There's probably a place for both, but I think this is the future. I think this gives the OEM much more flexibility in design and space, as you've mentioned before. Uh, I think this is the future. <laughs> Standing in front of a Chevrolet Bolt, it's a little hatchback. There are parts of it, its design that aren't quite as elegant um, as the Tesla. 
or even the BMW. Jason, can you show us one? This heavy ass thing goes inside the engine bay here and is used as like a shelf, literally like a shelf to hold half the components this thing needs to be an EV. You wouldn't need this if the thing was designed from, the, from scratch, from clean sheet of paper to be an EV, but it wasn't really. It has an engine bay that they had to kind of make work. So they put the electric motor on the bottom and they have this ridiculous shelf to kind of stack everything on. Yeah. GM understands how to mass produce things. That's all fine, but it's not really an elegant solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. All right, we're sitting inside of the BMW i3, kind of an experimental car in some ways. It's made out of some wacky materials. It's completely different than anything else. It's totally. exotic. This whole body is carbon fiber. Yeah, which is unusual. Like, you usually see that on a supercar. It's all glued together. There's hardly any actual fasteners. There's some aluminum in here. It is a clean sheet EV design, though. It's not adapted from anything else. And it's also a body on frame vehicle, so the, this carbon fiber body is one thing, and then the battery and the motor unit and the wheels and suspension are all on this skateboard that can be driven independently, like an old VW pan or something Yeah, just like that. take the body off, just drive the frame around, it'd be fun. It's like a technology experiment demonstrator kind of thing. It, and very different from the steel other cars that we saw earlier. Yeah, it's not, not the future, but it is pretty fascinating though. So we're here now in the Tesla Model 3, which is of course the main reason most of you probably clicked in this video. It's the one that gets most of the attention, both good and bad. And a lot of the bad part comes from people who have said there's quality issues. And while this is an early one, they may have improved a lot of things since we've seen this one, but there are some strange decisions made. For example, this welding flange here, we're told is about three times as wide as it needs to be. And if you look at the way this part right here in the door frame is fastened, you have sinusoidal welds, you have spot welds and rivets all in one little area, which conventional thinking would say is probably not a great idea. It's a strange idea and no one's really exactly sure, other than the people at Tesla, why they did it. There's definitely some manufacturing weirdness uh, going on here, but, but if you look at the overall product, yeah. if you, you know, anyone who's driven a Model 3 will say it handles really well. It's a very yeah. stiff structure and it's very safe. Yeah, and there's a lot of room inside. I mean, you can tell this is a clean sheet EV design because it's a pretty elegant layout. Things are packaged well. It's not like the Bolt where everything's just kind of thrown in wherever it'll fit. This is, everything's really well thought through and the result is a pretty nice package. Thanks to Monroe for showing us so much nerdy stuff. We saw motors, batteries, electronics. It was, it was a lot. It was a lot of stuff. My brain still actually kind of hurts from it all. But I think like we learned a lot and we saw that there's three really different ways that people are building EVs right now. So we got a weirdo experiment one, we got one that's kind of conventional, just adapted, and then we got this guy over here, the Tesla Model 3, which is kind of a clean sheet design, but just conventional enough and... Elegant. Kind of elegant, yeah. I think, I think that's gonna be the future. I think so too. We're gonna have to listen to Elon Musk for like decades now. Ooh. Oh well. But look, this was amazing, uh, and again, thanks to everyone at Monroe. I learned a lot. I hope you guys enjoyed it and you know, thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks.